Welcome back, everyone. We'll now start the Committee of the Whole. We have four items before us. The first one has to do with a request to initiate the review process for a potential annexation of approximately 65 acres located in Bellingham's northern urban growth area, known as the Mount Baker Highway Britain Road annexation. Um, per state law, a meeting must be held by the City Council to determine whether or not to initiate the review process for any proposed mm -hmm. annexation. There are certain uh, decisions that we can make and criteria that we have to consider. Shall I throw it to you, Moshe, first or Greg? I'll start. Thank you, Council. Good afternoon. Greg Ockett, Planning and Community Development Department. Uh, Moshe is going to provide you with a brief staff presentation. I just wanted to emphasize uh, something that you just said, Michael. This is the initiation part of the process, so this is the beginning. If, if Council agrees, uh, staff will analyze the proposal, including the service needs of the city and the financial impacts of the annexation. And one of the other things that um, you need to do as part of the initiation process is to set the boundaries of the annexation, and that will become important um, as Moshe does his uh, introduction and staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. My name is Moshe Quinn. I'm with the Planning and Community Development Department, and this presentation is in regards to the Mount Baker Highway Britain Road annexation area. So as uh, Greg mentioned, we received an annexation petition request in late October. Uh, the main petitioner was from the Hansen family, and their property is located right here in this triangular-shaped area here. Moshe, could you move the mic a little closer to you? Sorry about Thank that. Thank you. So the Hansen family submitted their petition application, which is their property right here, as well as they also have the Gundy's ownership had also signed the petition for annexation. So as... Uh, was mentioned this area is located in the city's northern urban growth area. It's bounded by the Mount Baker Highway to the northwest, city limits to the north, I mean to the south, excuse me, and county properties along the eastern boundary. Some of the existing conditions associated with the area is that, of course, you have the Gundy's auto wrecking site there, which is a non conforming use. It's been there for some time. You also have some businesses located here at the intersection of Mount Baker Highway and uh, Britain Road, which are also non-conforming uses in this area. You have uh, two residential subdivisions, the Hillside Estates and the Toad Creek Vista subdivisions that were built in the early 2000s, and they are all currently on city utilities of sewer and water. And as part of the service agreement, uh, each property had to sign into a no protest annexation agreement. So when they came through, so when looking at all the petitions that were signed as well as the no protest, basically you're at about 24 million in assessed valuation and the total valuation of the area is just over 25 million. Uh, some of the other existing conditions is that you have Toad Creek that bisects the area right through the center here as well as you have some high pressure gas mains as well as uh, transmission uh, power lines running through the, uh, the northeast section of the area. Uh, this map is from the urban fringe subarea plan that was adopted by the county. Uh, what this shows is that this area right in here is within the Britain Road residential planning area. The entire area is zoned urban residential mixed use, which is primarily a, a residential single zoning designation that allows six dwelling units per acre up to 12 utilizing TDRs or having public facilities. So um, as Michael mentioned, uh, the revised code of Washington requires the city to hold a meeting within 60 days, which we have met that requirement uh, today and a council needs to determine whether to accept, reject, or modify the proposed annexation as, 
as well as require simultaneous adoption of zoning regulations, as require assumption of all or any portion of city indebted indebtedness to that area. Some other existing and future conditions that we have is that the entire area is served by Fire District 4. Again, the area is zoned urban residential mixed use. Uh, currently, there's 92 dwelling units with an estimated population of about 208 people. So with the vacant developable land, it equates out to about 19 to 24 new dwelling units, serving a population of about 43 to 54 new residents. Uh, as mentioned earlier, over 90% of the properties are already on city utilities. Uh, the last note, the redevelopment potential of Gundy's, we kind of broke that area out because it's really hard to determine if and when that area will be re redeveloped. Um, so that way we just broke it out to let you know what the current capacity is and what possible future capacity could be once that area redevelops into residential units. So as Greg mentioned, you know, if this proposal is initiated, we will do a financial impact analysis on the entire area and present that to council as part of the public hearing. Some of the early projected needs that were identified were four firefighters, uh, interlocal agreement with Fire District 4 for basically automatic aid or first response into that area. As you may be aware, Fire District 4 has a station that just basically abuts this area. Uh, two police officers have been identified uh, for service for this area as well as there are no parks or trails within this area so that will be based on estimated new population so that will be part of the financial analysis. Uh, another note I would like to mention is that with the four firefighters and two police officers it's just not this one annexation alone that's causing that service need. It's also other annexations that we, the city has approved in the past that has increased the city boundaries further to the north. So uh, just recently on December 5th, we also received uh, another annexation petition request to be added on to this original proposal. Uh, it basically comprises about seven, just over seven acres, nine acres, including all the rights of ways that are associated with that. Currently, there's uh, one existing dwelling unit. However, that is in the WASDOT right of way, so mainly this entire property is undeveloped right now. And I think there's another corner piece that's tied to, uh, that's owned by one other person that also signed the petition. So uh, this area has a capacity of 63 to 118 new dwelling units. Uh, based on it mostly being undeveloped. Uh, so that brings up the total combined, if you added this area, to 82 to 142 dwelling units, which is much different from the original, which was only 19 to 24 dwelling units. So it really adds more capacity. So here is the side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, here you have the original request, which makes logical service areas and annexation boundaries, but this as well does the same. So this property is just strictly across from the Hanson property to the west. I think the existing single family house is located right about there. And so that is the area right there. So, uh, you know, reviewing the city's current comprehensive plan, it is consistent and we listed the goals and policies that supports both annexations going through, either combined. Um, the area has potential to accommodate for new housing. Uh, it is a receiving area for transfer of development rights from the Lake Whatcom watershed, which when we do adopt zoning, we'd also add PDR requirements as other infill um, strategies to, to this area because in the URMX zone, they also allow a certain percentage of multifamily development in that area. I think it's 25% of the total allowed dwelling units. Um, both proposals, with the added area, we'll also create logical city limit boundaries. And of course, there's the presence of already of existing urban development. So city council has the option to, you know, initiate the annexation review process without modifications to the original petition. Option two, of course, initiate the annexation with the modification to the boundary and add that adjacent requested area or do not accept, accept any of the petitions that were submitted. Now, with staff recommendation, in the original memo, when that was developed, we didn't have that other request in, so we, didn't, we weren't able to update uh, the file information at that time, but we did try to add the, uh, the new resolution exhibit 
and, and the applicant's request. So it's staff's recommendation now to initiate the annexation review, modify the boundary to include the requested area by adopting the resolution that's listed as attachment six in your packet, simultaneously adopt adoption of zoning regulation and assumption of all or any portion of city indebtedness to the area. And with that, I can take any questions you may have. So yeah, uh, attachment six is on page 228 and 229 of the packet. It's, it's buried after a lot of stuff. And that is the, up, that is revised <clears throat> and updated resolution if we accept the changed boundaries. That is correct. Okay. Terry? Yeah, just a quick question. You'd mentioned the existing zoning under parts about is uh, six uh, units per acre. What's that? in terms of square footage per lot size with that? The, uh, the comparable city zoning would be 7,200 square feet per unit 72. to 3,600 square feet okay. to get that 6 to 12. Okay. Thank you. Pinky? I'd like to move that we pass option two, uh, including the adjacent suggested areas. Second. We have a motion before us to um, accept the expanded geographic boundaries for the proposal review. Dan? I have some questions around um, page 84 of the packet, the stormwater facilities. Um, since the stormwater requirements for this area will need to account for the sensitivity of the receiving waters and must incorporate measures to deal with the water quality impairments as identified by Washington State Water Quality Assessment. Um, it also goes on to say that the uh, soils in this annexation area may uh, make infiltration of stormwater difficult. Current um, facilities there are culverts and ditches. Um, it looks like some are maintained by the property owners and uh, community associations of the subdivision. Uh, and it goes on to say that th th those facilities may be transferred to the city for operations. And I just want to understand a little bit more about that, what that, what that looks like and what the costs are. That's one of the things that we would analyze as part of the process. So we don't really have that information at this point, but we will look at the maintenance costs and maybe Ted can provide more information. Ted Carlson, Public Works. No, that, that's absolutely correct. We don't have specifics in terms of the cost, but Council may recall uh, in the recent years where we have accepted previously our stormwater facilities that had been uh, owned by homeowners associations and, and the responsibility of operation and maintenance was on those homeowners. That's the standard in the county when you have a residential subdivision. The stormwater facility is transferred to the homeowners association. In the city, those are transferred to the city for ownership and maintenance. So over the last few years, we have been bringing some of those privately maintained facilities into the city's inventory so that we can ensure that they're operated and maintained to our standards. So that would be the analysis that we would go through. We don't want to say uh, with certainty that they would come over to the city, but we would be looking at that possibility. Thank you. So the summer bill statement says there are actually three decisions that we can consider making. The first one is the one we have a motion for, which has to do with the geographic boundaries. Is there any further discussion of the geographic boundary issue? The motion is to accept the enlarged area for review. All those in favor of the large area for review signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, larger area. Also, um, Question two is whether or not the city will require simultaneous adoption of zoning regulations. And question three is whether the city will require the assumption of all or any portion of the city's indebtedness. Can you speak to those two issues? Uh, we recommend that those that the council approve both of those conditions. It's okay. standard with, with annexations. With regard to the, the zoning one, I think I may have been misunderstanding this. Uh, when something comes into, is annexed, um, do we or do we not um, simultaneously consider changing the zoning or does it come in under comparable zoning by default? It comes in under comparable zoning by default and if we want to consider something else, we would do it after it's annexed. Okay, so what does it mean to consider the simultaneous adoption of zoning regulations? It means that we would um, craft and adopt the zoning designation that's most comparable to what's in the county. Okay. And we've annexed a number of URMX areas in the past, um, so we have experience with this. We have already have a zoning district that is comparable that we can apply. Okay. And those two things are already included in the resolution if we pass yes. that? Yes. Dan? 
um, mayor has asked for and council has agreed to uh, provide two new police officers um, annually um, as part of our uh, addressing growth issues. Is, and then in this um, document, it calls for two new police officers. Is that above and beyond the additional two that we are currently now investing per, per year, or is that, is that included? Yes, uh, it's, it's my understanding that it would be the answer. Oh, sorry, above and beyond the two. So two additional as well as the two per year that was set forth. Go ahead, to Just add on to that. Um, there's not an immediate need. When you bring in property, you discuss the phasing in of those services. Um, and essentially, you're required to say how in a six-year period you're going to accommodate it. So as we go forward and look at the financial analysis, we'd see how that would fit in with the overall city plan. And then it becomes part of a long-range need of, uh, of addressing long-range need, long needs. Um, the reason I want to make that clear is council will be seeing in January the annexation phasing strategy. And again, we'll identify the gross number of folks we'll need ultimately. But the art of it is also to look about when you bring them on board and to spread them over time um, so that you can make disclosure to those who vote for annexations of uh, what the services expectation could be. April. Um, well, I'm, I, I'll be supportive of the second question, but it, it brings to what we had discussed in the comprehensive plan, and I, we're missing one of the policies that talked about in these greenfield sites of how we're going to make sure we don't make the same mistakes of the past. So we had talked about either incentivizing or encouraging um, integrated housing styles, and I know that the infill toolkit would be allowed here. So one, I think it's just uh, making sure that we stay on top of that and we keep that at the top of what we were going to be looking at in um, cleaning up our zoning code, but then also ensuring that, like this, this is right now going to be um, a car-centric community. However, if we were to look at our zoning, talk about those convenience stores, the different policies that we had to allow for different types of development, I think it's going to be really important that we stay on that as we look at that annexation phasing plan. Michael. So we do have a resolution. Uh, I just want to make a motion. Oh, Kelly, go ahead. Mayor Kelly. I think I should have a little beeper down here for you. Or a taser a shocker be in the seat. <laughs> Get him a taser. Well, first of all, of course, uh, we, we do want to have integrated communities, and we're going to plan that way, and we have great staff that thinks that way. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, and then, of course, you can also keep us keep on top of us, make sure we are. Um, but secondly, some of the mistakes of the past were either not annexing places we should have annexed because of cost of police and fire or not adding the police and fire when we did annex. And my um, direction to staff has been, does it make sense to an annex this property for our city's growth? And if it does, how do we determine how to pay for the level of service, especially public safety, that we need to pay for. So um, I, I guess my recommendations to you are going to come with what we need um, and not try to uh, get annexations without paying for the full cost of them. And I really support this annexation and the ability that we have to do the right thing out here. So. Um, I guess I just put my recommendation in, and I do believe in talking both, uh, especially with fire, but with fire and police, that we have a path forward to pay for the services that we need in our growth management window. So, Roxanne? I just move that we pass the resolution to initiate the re a review process for a potential annexation on the Mount Baker Highway in Britain Road. Second. So that's a motion to uh, recommend approving the resolution. I'm starting on page 228 tonight. Um, we had a comment over here from a staff member. Yeah, sorry to trouble you. Lieutenant Almer with the Be Bellingham Police Department. Uh, to with regards to Councilman Hamill's uh, information, yes, this would be two additional officers, but it's not based solely on this proposed annexation. In the last three years with the uh, Pacific Aldrich annexation and the East Baker View Road and Mount Baker Highway annexations, police staffing was an increase for those. So if you put this third one in with that group, you're looking at roughly uh, 500 acres 
of annex property with an approximate valuation of $68.5 million, and depending on development and how that goes, up to 2,300 citizens. So all the three of those annexations are on the borders of our response area since we're centrally located. So that's, I just want to explain the, the reason for the two additional. It's not just based on this one, so apologize. Thank you. Um, so I believe it's really appropriate that we look at this annexation, but I do want to echo and maybe extend some of uh, April's comments. I think this is an opportunity. I don't want to miss it. Every time we annex, I always think we should be looking at, if not immediately, very soon thereafter, considering a rezone. If some of this uh, property comes in under the just comparable zoning, that may not be the appropriate or the best thing for our future. We may face undevelopment. We may have coordinated development opportunities we miss. Um, I'm not asking that the Gundys go out of business, but if their property is ever redeveloped, that is a huge opportunity, and it needn't all be residential, for example. I mean, uh, it, it could be, you know, commercial, for example. It's a well, very well-located place for business right now. It could continue to be a well-located business and maybe residential uh, uses in the future. It's those sort of um, zoning considerations that I think we need to entertain soon right after um, annexation if this goes forward. Any further discussion on the um, recommended resolution tonight? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, I'll bring that forward, the positive recommendation to uh, initiate the annexation review process. The next item on our agenda is consideration of an ordinance adopting a limited amendment to the city's Shoreline Master Program. We had a agenda item on this at our last meeting. The city has proposed a limited amendment to the Shoreline Master Program, affectionately called the SMP, that one, redesignates the recreational use sub-area to the shoreline mixed use within the waterfront district shoreline designation, two, creates an allowance for standalone non-water-oriented non -water uses in the log pond area only, and three, clarifies which portions of the shoreline mixed use sub area allow residential uses. I'm going to stop reading right there. Maybe <laughs> Mr. Sundin, you could put this in plainer English language, uh, or maybe Mr. Nabafeld, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, good afternoon. Kurt Nabafeld, Planning Community Development Department. Um, you did a great job, Michael, in explaining that. Uh, also, if you recall, Steve did a, a kind of an introduction to this uh, topic last week. Uh, this is a limited amendment uh, to our shoreline master program. And we are asking that you do um, take action on some attached ordinances with that today. Uh, this is, again, this is a process that started several years back, and this is kind of the final steps. Uh, mm -hmm. This has gone through public process, through planning commission, as well as Department of Ecology review over the years. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Sundin. Thanks, Kurt. Steve Sundin, Planning Department. Uh, start out with just a couple reminders here, and then we'll kind of get into the few and kind of straightforward details of the actual ordinance so that you understand what's happening or are reminded of what's happening. Probably recall that last week I showed this exhibit. Thank you, Gene. Uh, the dotted line shows the area that we're talking about and it's, mm -hmm. I guess I'd say, non-relationship to the area in solid black. Uh, this area is separate from any anticipated sub-area changes that we might consider next year for the waterfront district. <laughs> Second, this is the area that we're talking about, and what's important to note here is that the existing 50-foot buffer, uh, which is the largest buffer in this particular area of the waterfront only at Cornwall, Cornwall Avenue Beach or Park on the south end of Cornwall Avenue Landfill has a similar 50-foot uh, buffer. There's an additional 25-foot setback, um, and so that's staying the same as it is now. And this is the area that's affected. And we also went through some of the uses um, that would then be allowed under this amendment, and the uses that would be allowed in addition to what are allowed today are those things that don't have any relationship to the water, so those could be anything allowed by the underlying zoning, including offices, uh, community public facilities, um, industrial manufacturing, warehousing facilities, um, any of the uses by, allowed underneath the underlying zoning.
The area highlighted in yellow shows the recreational use sub area. And that's what we initially proposed. Remember that we proposed this uh, prior to the sub area plan being adopted, waterfront district sub area plan. And so we were working off some conceptual drawings at that point, mm -hmm. and we had at that time presupposed that there would be uh, extensive areas of park and trail. The change would not prohibit that if that's what the community decides that we still want to do in the future. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that is is changing us, and I'll get to this in a second, but we're, we're essentially bringing that uh, shoreline mixed use designation that's at the top of the waterway, which is right here, essentially extending it to uh, the corner of the log pond. Initially, when we started, I, I think in some of the materials, you'll see the language recommended changes kind of peppered throughout some of the, the memo and some of the descriptions. When we first proposed this, um, we had <clears throat> labeled this area. We had called it a use exception area. We really didn't know what to call it, but we knew that this area was going to be slightly different than a lot of the other shorelines in the waterfront district. If you had an opportunity to read through um, <clears throat> Department of Ecology's material and some of the public comments that were in the matrix, a lot of the comments focused around this concept and what ecology recommended that we change was to get rid of this phrase. It's nowhere to be found anywhere in anything that is about shorelines management, sets a bad precedent. Basically, they said, this is a horrible idea. Why would you call it that? Uh, so instead, we coordinated with the port and DOE, and what they asked us to do, or what they recommended for us to do, was to simply, and this one shows it here, this would be post-amendment, this would just bring the shoreline mixed use, uh, shoreline designation down to the corner of the log pond, as you can see. And <clears throat> what that does, it does, allows the non-water oriented uses, retains the existing buffer width. The height would be increased to 35 feet. The prior height was 25 feet, but that's because all we anticipated there was park space. And so we were thinking about public structures and not needing to have the same height. So the the height, which is the same for the shoreline mixed use up in this area, has just simply been brought down to 35 feet. Um, and the other requirements in terms of uh, mitigation, habitat restoration, provisions for public access, all of that is the same as it is in the shoreline mixed use sub area. So when we went through the entire public process, which is kind of outlined in Exhibit A in DOE's letter, uh, and their attachment. Uh, this is what they concluded we needed to do to be consistent with the Shoreline Management Act and the guidelines in the, in the WAC that talk about amending programs. And if you did this, uh, this and the other changes that are part of this would all be consistent with the policies in the Shoreline Management Act. Uh, so that's really the, that's really the depth of, of this and how far that goes. Are there any questions? Council members? Don't see any. So uh, exhibit D is a proposed ordinance beginning on page 264 of the packet. Move approval. Second. Uh, we have a motion before us to approve the ordinance. Roxanne? Do you see the recommended motion that we should probably state? I never look at those. <laughs> and I can I help with that. I think that's important. That's my fault. <laughs> Can I say one thing just before that, and that is there's mention of sending uh, an acceptance letter. And so basically what we, what we do, it's very simple. We say to DOE, if, if this moves forward tonight, I'll write a letter tomorrow that would say, Dear DOE, we accept your recommended changes by virtue of accepting uh, having done first and second reading of the ordinance. And we'd send them a copy of, of that. So the motion before us is to approve the resolution of the ordinance. Um, but you're saying in addition to that, we would want to, which adopts DOE's recommendations, but in addition to that, let, we want to. Let me to rephrase it, Michael. Also, I, will, I make a most direct staff to send an acceptance letter to DOE and perform first and second reading of the ordinance. Second. Okay, we now have an amended motion before us, which includes both the ordinance and an acceptance letter. For approval tonight, is there any further discussion? 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. On to the third agenda item, which I believe is a climate action plan. This has to do with an update to the city's climate action plan in the year 2017. The city is updating our 2007 climate action plan to guide the next phase of emission reduction actions for both city government and also for the community that we serve. In 2017, the climate action plan update summarizes actions taken to implement the previous 2007 climate action plan, reviews progress towards previously established reduction goals, and establishes future emission reduction goals and further identifies additional measures that will further reduce emissions. Uh, staff are here to provide an overview of that 2017 climate action plan update and to answer our questions. Mr. Carlson? Yes, thank you. Ted Carlson, Public Works Department. Uh, you'll recall call that we were before council last month providing an update on the process that we've been going through to update the climate action plan. At that time, we had not uh, finalized the draft plan. So we were giving you an update showing some of the, the efforts that had been underway and how we fared in relation to the 2007 climate action plan goals. We have completed the draft plan and posted that on the website and sent a leak to council. Uh, we wanted to take today to go through the plan, kind of the framework of the plan, highlight some of the, the items in the plan and how it's laid out. We did include a resolution in the council packet, but there's certainly no obligation to uh, approve the climate action plan today. There's no deadline on when the council takes action. Plenty of time to have future work sessions, make sure all your questions are answered, uh, and staff gets any direction that council would like to give us before we move forward with ultimately adoption of the updated plan. So today we wanted to uh, go through some of the highlights uh, Nate will do that through the PowerPoint, and then we'd be happy to answer any questions that council may have. So with that, I'll turn over to Nate Rice. Thanks, Ted. Good afternoon. Thanks for the opportunity to present to you again. I presented to you on November 13th with an overview of the results of the Climate Protection Action Plan update. And today, I'm going to briefly review the report that's included in the packet today, and then take your questions and comments. <clears throat> In my last presentation, I covered the results of the plan update. And as a quick review, both the city and community uh, achieved and exceeded the 2012 emissions targets. And municipal emissions appear to be on track to meet the 2020 target. Community emissions increased more since 2012 and will require concerted effort to meet 2030 targets. So I'm going to walk you through the draft um, protection, climate protection action plan update report um, and show you the overall structure and what to expect from the document. There are two main sections. Uh, the overview <clears throat> includes executive summary, background, emissions updates, and reduction targets. So this focuses on what's already happened um, and sets the context for <clears throat> the climate action plan update which is looking forward into the future with core strategies, emissions forecasts, uh, the reduction measures included in those forecasts, and then a more in-depth description of all the measures um, over time. So looking at the overview section here, <clears throat> the executive summary introduces this graphic which acts as a conceptual map to the report. So there are the six core strategies I discussed last time energy efficiency and conservation, transportation, renewable energy, green building, waste reduction, and land use. And these are a new addition since the 2007 plan um, in an effort to emphasize the solutions that Bellingham is using to uh, address the problem of climate change and to help readers find strategies they're interested in. So they're color-coded throughout the report uh, to help readers navigate. And then the circles in this figure represent the two levels of emissions that are um, reported on and tracked. So on the inside is the municipal level, which is city government operations. And then on the outside is the community level, which is emissions within city limits. And the figure captures how emissions are calculated uh, with municipal emissions being included in the overall community emissions total. 
I'm going to show a number of pages from the report just to give you a sense of it, but obviously no need to read this tiny text here. In the executive summary, uh, each of the six strategies gets its own page with brief context, updates, next steps at both the municipal and community levels, uh, as well as references to pages for more information. The background section includes a climate science update and a climate policy update, and then gets into greenhouse gas emissions update, <clears throat> which covers past emissions inventories and the trends over time. And we talked about this a bit in my last presentation. And you might remember we have a baseline emissions inventory from the year 2000, followed by uh, 2005, 2012, and 2015 inventories to track progress. And then um, municipal and community emissions are broken down by sector and discussed in this section as well. So that helps set the context to start looking forward um, with the 2017 Climate Action Plan update. And this section starts with emissions forecasts. And these forecast graphs are really the key to the climate plan. Um, the colored bars show emissions from the six sectors starting in 2015 from our most recent emissions inventory and then going out to 2030. And the black line on the top shows the no action forecast with no emissions reduction measures applied. And that space between the black line and the colored bars that grows over time um, represents the calculated emissions reductions that are possible with the ongoing and proposed measures in this report. So this graph is really a pathway that shows us how we can reach the emissions reduction targets. So the next table um, shows the actual ongoing and proposed emissions reduction measures that are included in that forecast. And I'll zoom in a bit here. <clears throat> so a measure is a term that's carried over from the 2007 plan and is basically anything that reduces emissions. It could be a discrete action or a more broader program. Um, and that forecast figure is a graphical representation of these measures and the emissions reductions that are possible uh, when they are implemented. So this table includes only the forecasted measures that are in the future and that are quantifiable. There are additional measures that have already been completed in the past and so aren't included in the forecast. And there's also measures that are further into the future that aren't quantifiable enough to include in a calculated forecast. And those are included in <clears throat> the next section that covers all municipal emission re reduction measures, past, present, and future. Um, so including completed measures um, and those that aren't quantifiable at this point. For example, LED street light upgrades, which you might not actually be able to read here. That's a, a, a completed measure, a more discrete action. Um, and then an action that's further out into the future would be wastewater heat recovery, something that's been looked at preliminarily but hasn't been scoped or isn't quite ready to be incorporated into the emissions forecast. So all of these measures are then described in detail in the rest of the document. Um, beginning with municipal measures, each um, strategy is, uh, gets its own section and is color coded. Um, and then they are broken down by sector. And the last section is, uh, gets into the community measures uh, following that same format. Happy to take any questions or comments. Okay, council members. April, I'm sorry, Pinky. You can call me April. <laughs> Uh, I, I just want to thank you so much for putting this together. I, I, this has been a long time coming, and I'm really happy to see it. Um, but I would like to take the recommendation that this be um, step one um, and that we are not ready to pass a resolution. I think that I would like to move that we um, 
uh, have a work session on this and kind of breaks down some additional factors. A couple things that I uh, did not see that I would like to see be part of this plan it was in regards to accountability and reporting. Uh, I think that over the last, over our last climate action plan that we didn't always know what's going on. And in the future and when we implement this, I want to know exactly how our updates are gonna be, what we're measuring against, and how we're gonna have community involvement. So I'd like to move that we actually have a work session and move this to committee uh, and, and keep exploring different things in our climate action plan. I'll, I'll second that. What committee are you intending to send it to? Uh, well, it's in committee of the whole right now, so um, I don't know if that needs to public be necessary. We will and, be having next year a new committee of public works yeah, and natural resources, but it could be committee of the whole. And I admit I'm a little biased because I'm probably the only person who read the whole report, but <laughs> with underlines. But uh, I'd like to be involved in that. Maybe if it's possible, could we decide what committee after we do our reorganization? Because um, I would like to be involved in, in this process. Okay, so whole? I just think committee of the whole would be appropriate. It's a big topic. It's my suggestion, but I just want to make sure the council is comfortable with that. Okay, so it looks like there's agreement uh, that the motion is to refer to this to further discussion in committee of the whole sometime early next year. Um, I'm I, I'm going to support this. I, I do really like this work, but there's a lot in here I have not even begun to digest. I'd also like to um, open up the process to the, the the public. I think they'll like what. They're seeing here, but they may have ideas and impact, or in, in ideas, or an input that will affect how we go forward. Um, this is a, a, a great document, but no, Pinky, I did not read over 100 plus pages on this one, and um, maybe I should. Uh, April? That was my question just as far as uh, opening up for public comments. Uh, I know we don't have to have a public hearing, but what are, what are we thinking as far as getting feedback now that it's been published and is out there for consumption? I think a work session might open that discussion up. Um, I'm not prepared to know exactly at this point what parts of the feedback. I do know, um, I don't want to open a Pandora's box, but I will say that the, the county has recommended a citizen advisory group on their climate action plan. I'm not saying I'm proposing that. I haven't had an opportunity to look at it. It has been suggested. So I think that there are, uh, you know, we went from one week to another, so we had a lot of materials to look at in just a couple of days. So uh, um, I don't know what those recommendations are yet. Dan? Uh, Councilmember Vargas just said exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> Well, I think from I, my question was really I, guess I should have directed it towards staff as to how, how did you see this moving forward as far as getting um, feedback from the public? Were you wanting to open up a process? Or are you going to have some town halls? Or are you going to what? How are you going to get feedback on this one? Well, I think our thinking was very similar to Councilmember Vargas that starting that process was the council presentation, the work sessions, thinking that perhaps out of those discussions there may be some direction or thoughts on how we might want to pursue additional public comment. Uh, we're certainly open to that discussion. We had not anticipated doing anything like a town hall or going to necessarily individual neighborhood meetings, uh, but we certainly welcome public input. We want to make sure that we get uh, as much input as possible. We've obviously been working with the stakeholder groups as we develop the plan uh, and received quite a bit of uh, community input through folks that are involved in the um, the climate arena, but there's obviously much more input that we would potentially receive as we went through a different process. So it's council's uh, discretion, whatever you'd like us to do. Mayor Kelly. Well, and um, I was not aware that the county had put together, a, you know, a, a committee, and I would suggest that we also explore what they're doing so that we don't have a city committee and a county committee necessarily. It, there's probably would be the same people except for the elected officials that were on it. So, and like I said, I have, I am speaking blind because I don't know exactly what the goals are or anything, but um, that's just something else I think would be good for the committee as a whole to, to discuss. So we can get some information about what they're doing. Roxanne. I just want to thank you because this is what I hoped the outcome would be for this specific agenda because I want this to be a work in progress. 
uh, better partnerships with our community members. Our community cares so much about our local environment, and I want to have those stakeholders and citizens with us. Pinky. Uh, I thank you, Mayor, for uh, you said exactly what I was thinking, is that maybe there could be some overlap between the county and the city. But again, I just learned this information and I haven't had an opportunity to digest it. So maybe uh, we will be better. It, that could be an option for us is to maybe combine. April. Um, I, I have not read the document. Um, uh, I'm interested as we move forward in the work session, though, uh, it it was in the in the resolution it talked about implementation and I was interested if in the document it talks about policy recommendations that can help with that implementation and then if so great I'll see it whenever I read it if not that to me is something that I really like to talk about just to make sure that we understand where we're trying to go to so the policy. document, Renee LaCroix, Public Works, the document um, has a lot of majors that are aspirational where it says city staff will look into things. And I think depending on, on what the outcome of it is of those um, examinations and delving into more issues, we might come back and ask for policy. But the document itself doesn't have policy direction in it. Okay, the motion before us is to refer uh, further discussion of the uh, draft climate action plan to committee the whole. Um, I really love this, but I, I do need to chew on it longer. Nathan, thanks so much for the presentation and, and for all the good work you've been doing. Ted? Uh, I would just ask that when you do get a chance to look at the materials as you go through it and have questions, uh, if, if you want to send them to me in advance of the next work session, that would help us prepare our presentation and, and uh, provide you the information that you need. Okay, any further discussion of the motion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so um, we won't pass this resolution today, but we'll bring that up early next year. Uh, in the f interim, um, I would please ask uh, members of the public who are interested in, in these sort of issues and all the ways this will touch city and community operations to look over that document, just like we're going to have to look over that document. So the next item on our agenda is a work session regarding an ordinance adopting protections for residential tenants. If you recall, we already have a motion to bring this back uh, for a formal work session at our second meeting in January, on January 22nd. Um, but we wanted to touch on the issues a little bit uh, during this uh, meeting minute to hopefully shape what will happen on the 22nd when the ordinance may come back in some other form. We have in our packet a uh, um, memo written by City Attorney Peter Rafato, which touches on a couple of issues and notes some of them and makes recommendations on, on others. Um, do you want to begin with Mr. Rafato? Yeah, I think I'll start. I think Rick uh, also wants to uh, uh, talk a little bit, but just the way I organized this, this was my attempt at organizing the different categories of uh, questions or points and the the first category is really I think I think this is how we would I would proceed uh, to come up with a, uh, a different draft ordinance subject to any objections by council the second category is <clears throat> where I think we would need to further council discussion and direction and potentially consultation with an outside entity and 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 the third category is just my my proposal for what you don't necessarily have to decide right now to get an ordinance passed. They may be, um, th and that's obviously the council may disagree, but um, um, but those don't necessarily affect the language of an ordinance. So that's that's how I organize that. Mr. Sepler. Yes, I, I just want to speak to enforcement specifically. I know that was a concern that was raised by council. Um, just kind of talk about the tiers of enforcement and uh, how it would be accommodated should you choose to proceed with the ordinance and adopt it. Um, the easiest, of course, are um, monitoring uh, the ads that are used for rentals. And uh, those are easy. The ones that have uh, Section 8, for example, prohibited. Those are very easy for us to scan from time to time and to um, send uh, notice that they had to be removed or modified. That, that's a simple sort of uh, um, task, a secretarial task almost. And we'd certainly be able to do that. And you do that periodically enough, you eventually uh, dissuade people of the habit of using that. 
Um, the second is dealing with complaints, and um, at present we still have a uh, complaint-based system for our uh, code compliance. Um, I need to note the difficulty on an individual complaint asserting that um, they were denied, uh, for example, a uh, rental because specifically of their source of income. Um, although that is a consideration, it's one of many considerations and it would be difficult for us on a case by case basis to discern um, what went on in the evaluations by the property owner. On the other hand, um, I would say that others who have pursued this line of enforcement have seen that there are patterns that tend to evaluate, uh, develop over time. And those patterns are fairly telling. And that's largely the way you'll get broader compliance if there are bad actors who consistently um, will not rent to people who have another source of income that uh, could accommodate that need. Um, that pattern could be assembled. I think that uh, it's important to note that there's a private right of action and uh, it wouldn't be just the city's responsibility or, or need to do that. Others could assemble that information, especially those who work um, in the field and realize that we might have a problematic uh, owner with multiple units and there's a high um, incidence where those who apply are denied. And I think that becomes much more probable um, to show a pattern um, that's developed. Could you explain the private right of action? I'm going to turn to uh, Peter on that. Yeah, Peter of Auto Legal Department. So the ordinance in the, in the case of source of income discrimination provides that someone can assert um, on a, in a, you know, outside of the city's enforcement mechanisms that a landlord has discriminated and it and it provides um, uh, damages up to five thousand dollars I believe if I'm remembering it correctly and so one of the groups uh, I know that in I think in the city of Vancouver um, I believe that there there's a sort of if you go on their on their web page on this uh, ordinance if you feel you've been discriminated against there's a reference to what we have as the Northwest Justice Project or you could look at law advocates and they could take up that case. Now, if there were a lot of cases like that, that could even be pursued as a class action type lawsuit. So the benefit of a private right of action is that, you know, you're entitled to do discovery uh, in a civil case that you wouldn't, that the city wouldn't necessarily be able to undertake in a civil infraction type process that the city would be uh, proceeding. But this ordinance has both. So it has both options as a form of remedy. Terry? Yeah, just a question on the idea of enforcement. When two or more people would apply for a rental unit and the landlord decides against the person with a Section 8 or some other voucher, what proof does the landlord need to show any? To show anyone, if is I'm just because I see this is where the real sticky wicket is. Is I don't is there actually any paperwork that they have to show that, or is it I looked at these and I decided on this one is it was a better applicant? I mean, I, I could attempt to answer that. Yeah. Each case would be uh, on its own merit. So there's nothing that we're requiring other than the ordinance itself that says you, you cannot discriminate this in this way. So we have right. lots of, and the state law, uh, state federal law has <coughs> lots of discrimination, you know, laws against discrimination. And mm -hmm. each of those will be handled on a case by case basis um, to the extent if there's proof, if there's evidence of that, then either city or a private party could, could pursue that proof. But yeah, I was just kind of curious because that seems to be the real big sticky part of that. If I might, on the other hand, though, if we do have a bad actor who has a history, you know, when you start assembling more information and you see a pattern that everyone who's applied who had some other source of funding um, was denied, that becomes a little more convincing, and um, I think that may be more actionable. So in essence, um, uh, I do think there is a remedy, um, but I think a case by case it's going to be difficult. We'll have to look for those patterns in the community. Gene, I think you're right. That was my question, too. You know, one time, if they say no to Section 8, that's one thing. But it's not going to be hard to figure out over a long period of time. If they just refuse to do it, then that's flat-out discrimination, what we're trying to eliminate. So I think that's going to be the only way we're going to be able to find out. 
Pinky. I had a question along that line as well. So what if a landlord chooses someone versus a Section 8 because of the inspection time and the fact that the house needs to be vacant? So um, in regards to a landlord who's trying to, uh, one tenant's leaving and trying to ha get new tenants in there, and if it means that they have to wait for an inspection and it must be vacant, and then all of a sudden it becomes almost a month of rent for that landlord, and they choose the person who doesn't need to have the house vacant um, to have an inspection. I mean, there's a lot of uh, variables in there. I mean, I, I you know, as... Uh, I would see that that would be an unfair financial burden for someone if maybe that's what their income is. Um, so I'm kind of curious about that, like what falls in this discrimination and in pertaining to the seven or ten days that the BHA needs to inspect the house. Like uh, Peter Rafato, I can tell you that the ordinance provides that um, a refusal to allow an inspection will not be a defense to this, to to a source of in this, uh, source of income discrimination um, assertion by either the city or a private entity. That's what the ordinance says, and that's I believe what the city of Vancouver said, which <clears throat> that was pointed to us as a good model to follow. So that's really up to council as to how you want to handle that. But right now, a refusal to have an inspection is not a basis under the under the language of the ordinance uh, to get out from the prohibition. And if I might to follow up, it's hard for us to discern why someone's denied rental. Um, there's no uh, requirement for a landlord to disclose um, why of multiple applicants they chose one. Um, there might be a requirement, again, if we see a pattern developing over time, um, to pursue it. Um, and I note that Peter has noted one of the issues that are not necessary for the ordinance, but it is, is uh, important for us to follow up on is to see if we can ensure a timeliness of inspection to avoid that issue ever being um, coming into play. Dan? Yeah, I share the same concern about the, the timing on inspections. Just, um, you know, if it can be down to the smaller number of days that are indicated here. Um, under item C, the seven to ten, or even less. I, mean, I don't know how that happens, but um, that would be beneficial, I think, both for the landlord and the tenant, so they can get into that unit. Unit. Um, I really want to understand <clears throat> under section B1 more the concerns of landlords. This was brought up by the Catholic uh, Housing Services on the 20-day notice of termination uh, in lieu for um, in lieu of uh, for cause eviction. So for, a for cause eviction is is like a black mark on your rental record with given the vacancy rates now and, and other challenges to housing that that could um, be bad, bad news for a renter um, I don't but I would not want to see that abused um, by, by landlords so I want to find and strike the balance and, and find out what the best um, management practice is on that and then item three the uh, exemption for the smaller number of units I did <clears throat> I don't I don't think there should be an exemption for um, for smaller number of units at all and I think in the under item, <clears throat> pardon me, I'm losing my voice here. Part uh, item A, number one, I think those um, those fines should graduate at 250 per offense. Um, you know, third offense would be a thousand, fourth would be 1250. And I know that the, uh, I believe it's Mr. Suppler or Rafato and I talked about com conformity to our other. Um, our other um, fines, fine structures. Uh, so, so I'd want to have a better understanding of: does this fit neatly in that, or is this something that's just different, or how that would work? Yeah, if I could just re address that right away, we, we don't typically have fines that go up to a thousand dollars per occurrence. So, so we would be immediately getting out of kind of the norm by going to those levels, and which is why I kind of stayed at the uh, below a thousand. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and take a turn and start with that. Um, uh, it may not, we don't, maybe not normally uh, levy fines up to 1,000, but an escalation from 500 to 750 seems like a kind of a non escalation. If we're going to do escalating, I think I might like going up to 1,000 if someone's a repeat offender. Um, I, I think I uh, agree with what was just said that I don't think we need to create an exemption for landlords with a small number of units. We just don't allow people to discriminate. 
you know, based on, say, gender or race and not on source of income. I, I don't think as you have only three units you should be allowed to discriminate. So I'm not interested in creating that exception. Um, I, I would like to further discuss the issue of delaying implementation. Maybe we could revisit that. I'm not sure quite I understand why people need a great deal of warning to adjust. Um, except with regard to one thing which was just brought up. Uh, I think it's really easy. It's no effort at all to not discriminate. You don't have to do anything to not discriminate. But the inspection regime, that's the one thing that someone who wants to rent to a Section 8 person has to do that you wouldn't have to do with somebody else. And it's that, it's that delay there. And if it's two weeks, that seems really burdensome. If it's three days, that doesn't seem so burdensome. If it's seven to 10, and then you're kind of in between. So I'd like to also continue discussing the possible delays, um, or if, if there is much of a problem with the delays with regard to the inspection portion. If you have a landlord who has not a discriminatory bone in their body, but there's a practical issue with delays, I'd like to talk about that further. April? I, I would agree on that one. And I think um, right now, understanding Bellingham Housing Authority's response to my letter was that they have one inspector mm -hmm. and that inspector is not only to go out and do new inspections but also to take care of all the things that they already have to do and um, I I don't know if that is necessary to have a work session um, <clears throat> yet again maybe bringing in um, I think Landmark is a great example they came before they're working with Lydia Place right now they're waiving their management fees in order to be able to uh, bring people, Section 8, all kinds of different vouchers, but they too are running into this, like from that moment of saying, okay, I'll accept a voucher to the moment of you actually uh, get approval for the money, there has to be some accountability, some performance, because I can see this flipping a little bit where right now it's pretty much supported by renters and, and several different people, but when you start taking something off the market for a long period of time when somebody else could have had access to that, we're going to see some crunch. And so I would also like to discuss, um, you know, people have talked about an ordinance like this, so it's just symbolic. I mean, really you're just saying, because if people want to get out of it, they'll, they'll go to month-to-month -month leases or they'll it just increase their rent just enough where they don't have to comply. Um, others have said it's going to cause management fees because uh, no longer is it you're just meeting with somebody the first time they say they want it okay you go through that process now you got to come back you got to be there for inspection many times you have to come back for other vouchers with the employee as well as the person who's um, who's wanting to use the voucher so it takes more time uh, so I, I'm wondering in in something like this we pass it and then we're not really sure of the outcome and I'd like to know if the outcome is what we really wanted, which was taking away that one barrier for people who have vouchers. And so I don't know if that's a, um, a, a group that comes together. I don't know if that's just yet until we have conversations, if that's a, a staff for us to recommend to staff to work with Western to find out some surveying type thing to really hit those questions. Did we have some unintended consequences? Did we really achieve what we wanted to achieve? And then we can come back and reevaluate the ordinance to find out what happened there and, and how should we move forward? I mean, that would be my recommendation. And the seven to 10 days, that's, that's at the time of vacancy. So it's, so you're, you're, somebody might say, okay, I'm given, I'm given, I'm given my 30 days to a landlord. Landlord publishes, posts, gets right now, some people are getting 45, 120 people that are saying they want that unit goes to get the unit and, and really to do the application and call references, you're like five days. I mean, you usually can get money from somebody and, and turn your place over. And then it's like when the person vacates, um, if they really want to work hard, they can have that turned over in 14 hours. Overnight, paint it, and here's your keys. So what we're saying is not only is you're doing the application, especially if you get it done within that first 10 days, now we're going to make you wait 20 days until we can actually say your unit's vacant, get you on the list to do inspection. Now you have 10 days for that process, and I don't even know if this person's gonna qualify. Mm -hmm. So one, I don't know if I'm gonna get the money for this unit, but I also don't know if my unit's gonna qualify. So it's just, what I think is great about us taking this long-term process, if we started to really unearth and undig these things, and I think that just helps us go eyes wide open. And um, I think that's why these work sessions are going to be really important. So I have forwarded to Peter and Rick, um, I think, again, Lydia Place, now that they're an owner 
Uh, so they're, they're a property owner now, so they have a really unique perspective of trying to uh, utilize other vouchers besides their, their own reimbursements into their units. And then again, Landmark is somebody that's working, um, trying to do some altruistic type things in the community. There's several other people that would be really good to bring in, whether it's in front of the council or just in a separate work session to nail down some of these things. And then, of course, some type of survey would be my hope. Terry? Yeah. I think when we're talking, unless I'm misunderstanding, when we're talking about Section 8, we're not saying in this ordinance that if somebody applies with Section 8 that they have to wait until there's an inspection to see what this, my understanding of this, all it says is that if more than one applicant's applying, you can't, one, you can't say we will not accept Section 8, but when all things are equal and you can pay and move in tomorrow and you have to, this one, you have to wait, they can make that decision to give it to you who can move in tomorrow. They don't have to wait till the inspection. Well, I don't see where it says anything different than that. So that's something that the council could choose to have built into the ordinance that would say um, that the time it takes for an inspection can be, uh, is a legal basis for um, refusing to rent to that individual. That, that's something you could, you could insert into the ordinance. Kind of guts the ordinance. I think that's where, oh, sorry. April. Well, I just I think that's where a work session, or or even uh, before our work session, if if it's not again in front of council, but having these different people who are really, I mean, Bellingham Housing Authority clearly wants to work with this. There's Opportunity Council vouchers, all kinds of different things to just dig into that. And uh, I haven't seen another community do it, but maybe that that creates some incentive in our human and social services too. If we had a a date that we could all agree upon, that once once somebody says yes, okay, it's called a I, they have a term, it's to use the voucher. So then that starts it. And then it's all the way to the point of inspection and there's more than that. And then it's to the point of actually getting the okay that the voucher will be dispersed. So there's this, there's this whole process with all the different vouchers that they have to go through and what are maybe finding out what is a reasonable time to ask people to wait. Because I, I think it's fair, I, I, as I've said many times, I own properties and, and I'm okay having to have my, my space vacant for a couple of days and for the greater good, that's, it's nominal compared to getting a really good tenant and having, um, uh, I would say, a, a, a source of income that is super. I mean, I know that I'm gonna be getting that regularly unless something were to change on it. That's, um, it's guaranteed in some ways. How, however, I certainly don't want to get into a position where, you know, that rattles on and, oh, their inspector's sick or so-and-so can't get there and now they've, we've had a rush of other things. So that for me is the crux and I think that will just take some, some gnawing and some working sessions personally before we can get there. And I don't know if we want to send that back to the planning committee and let them chew through that or have staff go and uh, work on that. I'm not, I'm not sure. Pinky and then Dan. I do I like the idea of kind of having a work session on these. I feel like there's a couple things that are unanswered. Um, I love that we're trying to find ways to reduce barriers for people. But again, unintended consequences of what maybe we're going to even reduce vacancy rate because of the longer turnaround. Um, but a couple things that I, I do want us to look at in that committee is um, the discussion um, on local mitigation fund mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that if landlords are willing to um, try something a little bit different and help people get through the process that they know that they are guaranteed and they're not going to be left in the lurch. Um, I have gotten um, some concern around um, uh, sometimes there's not enough accountability when a Section 8 um, person vacates and the house may or may not be in the best condition. So I think that that's something that we should talk about in regards to mitigation funds. But then also, uh, I'd also like to know what the process is that people go through to get a Section 8. And uh, this is kind of a little sidebar, but in regards to is there a pledge to be a good tenant or some, some sort of 
um, guidance around uh, tenant occupancy, and that's something that I've uh, received feedback on, is like there is, if a landlord's willing to take a risk, but also to ask the tenant to um, uh, be a responsible tenant. So I'd like to know what the process is in regards to um, in regards to just the qualifications, but also the information that they are receiving in order to become certified for section or getting a section eight voucher. Dan. <clears throat> you know, so I don't think that we have to fly blind on this. Um, <clears throat> we are certainly not the first municipality to, to do this. There are other examples. Um, Cal Oregon just passed it. Uh, California, uh, Dallas, Chicago, I, I believe Van uh, Vancouver's, uh, Washington is in that mix. Um, Mark Gardner, our legislative analyst, has done some of this background research, so it might be best to have him bring forward to the to the work session, you know, th those types of specific, you know, questions that are that are being raised here. What what have other jurisdictions done to um, to address these things? So I'd like to I'd like him to bring those forward those items forward. That that's fair. That's like a good idea for the 22nd, as well as, oh, sorry, uh, staff coming back and maybe working out some of the questions that Mr. Rafato raised. April? This la last question. Uh, I do want to understand better. Kelly Owens, who was in our planning sessions, but then she also spoke at the public hearing, mentioned really making sure that you get out, and I think she called it landlord affirmation, like making sure that landlords understand she used an a word I can't remember I don't have my notes now and I, I had asked that night so I can go back and watch the video but it was specific to what what her comments were to make sure that that landlords especially that haven't been part of this process who haven't been accepting these types of vouchers understand some legal term that she was talking about so I think it would be good to either reconnect with her or take a look at that Okay, I think we probably have enough dis staff direction. Um, or, and again, this is coming back on January 22nd. Is there any further we need to discuss right now with regard to this proposed ordinance? Okay, seeing none, we'll go on to the next item, which is approval of meeting minutes from December 4th. Move approval. Second. We have a motion to approve the minutes. Were there any changes noted? Okay, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 <laughs> Opposed? Those minutes are passed. Uh, old and new business. I'd first like to say that last Thursday, uh, several of us and the mayor uh, participated in the first meeting of the county's Homeless Strategies Work Group, uh, which was just initiated and will be meeting um, starting and going into the next year. And I know that uh, Mayor Kelly had something she wanted to say that uh, did touch on the issue of homelessness. And Rick, I have Rick here with me. Um, Friday, I took a letter down to the organizers of the camp outside uh, demonstration, and um, it was a, a kind of a uh, recounting of the rules, the things that needed to happen while the people are camping. Um, I have to admit that Jim, you know, has been trying to be very proactive in monitoring what's going on. However, when when Rick and I met with um, with Jim and Doug this morning um, we do we did note that they're not there all the time anymore so um, they they've ass, you know assigned roles to other people <clears throat> the expectation was that the demonstration would be done a week ago Sunday um, we extended it till Monday and then there was it's been hmm? it's been something Yes, it's been somewhat open-ended. Um, uh, they are going down to apply for a permit because one of the things we want to make sure is that there's a process followed so that we have the opportunity to say, yes, you can stay, or to another group that might come in, um, either yes, you can stay, or no, you can't stay, depending on what the, the, pur the purpose potentially is. So they said they would do that. Um, we met with them about their... Um, requests um, and as we went through everything it seemed like the focus that they wanted us to look at was safe camping a safe camping site so a place where people people could be outside that wouldn't get swept um, as you know that's a lot more this I mean it's an easy thing to 
potentially identify someplace, but it's a hard thing to make sure that people are safe that are staying there, et cetera. So um, I believe that I need direction from council if they want us to pursue what they have identified as their number one concern and give us an opportunity to talk to you about all the other things that we're working on right now and what the unintended consequences could be and what the cost is for the things that they've asked for. Um, so the plan right now was to give them the permit until Friday and then the permit will include an extension clause so they could stay. The concern is also as the holidays are coming up, if we don't have an alternative place for them to be, I doubt if we would be taking um, any kind of action during the holidays. So we need, um, myself and staff need some direction about if you would like us to pursue this number one issue that they have brought up. And I'll let Rick talk about anything that I might have have forgotten. Thank you, Mayor. I think you've covered um, the, the uh, set the stage for it. Um, let's talk specifically about implementing. Uh, should you choose to proceed, the, uh, should we choose to proceed down that route? How safe camping could be established, and what lessons we've learned elsewhere? Um, I'd first step back and say that um, we're very supportive of the group's goals, and I don't. Th I think it's relatively undisputed in the city. All of us would like to see housing for all of the residents of our community. Um, it's a significant challenge and there's a great deal of uh, uh, support of their aims. That being said, um, we also appreciate them coming in to discuss the issues with us. Um, it is uh, best to work together, um, especially in uh, difficult circumstances to see if we could find agreement. And I should also note that we did, uh, as the mayor noted, provide camp rules for them. Um, those are based on public safety and health and uh, they were immediately implemented uh, by the group and we give them uh, a great deal of uh, support and uh, thanks for doing so. It minimizes some of the friction that can occur uh, by the kind of use you see uh, going on outside. Um, as council is aware, we as a community spend more dollars probably than any community our size in Washington to try to tackle this issue. I think it was $4.9 million a year goes into housing and homelessness and services. And in doing that, um, we have to be very mindful that although that's a lot for a community of about 83,000, 84,000, um, City of Seattle has greater resources they bring to bear from the legislature, and they're able to provide a variety of different initiatives um, simultaneously. In our case, um, we're somewhat limited, so we have to be strategic. Um, we could do a number of things half well and really accomplish little or we could do one or two things that are key and, and causal. In looking at the um, camping, safe camping, um, it's a known quantity. Uh, the City of Seattle released back in June an assessment of their five safe camping areas. We know how much it costs to operate them and we know how much, uh, uh, what's needed to make them successful. Um, they're all relatively short term in duration. The goal is to get people out of the camps into more permanent housing. Towards that end, we do have a path that's available immediately. The state legislature um, through the RCWs have allowed that um, any religious organization can house a tent city or a camp safe camping area. So it is above our zoning and would essentially be able to uh, establish fairly quickly. Cities are allowed to get additional rules perhaps and condition them, but you're not allowed to say no. So there is a path forward. Um, as we understand it, um, the folks from Homes Now have tried to reach out to the religious community, uh, religious, religious organizations have not had success of yet. Um, it still might perfect itself. Um, absent that, um, it is somewhat of a challenge to find a location in the sense that um, it, like um, shelters, are very difficult to site. And in any location you go into, it is very highly likely that some group will find it um, not an appropriate use. We're somewhat, um, somewhat hindered in the sense that um, there is no neat fit in our zoning structure for this use, for a camping facility. 
And while we could uh, work to try to achieve them, each one of them runs into a number of concerns. Um, in residential areas, we run into all the things associated with family definition, households, and requirements. In commercial and industrial areas, we have to show the impacts are roughly proportionate. Um, we could make a code use or an interpretation on an interim or emergency basis, um, but there is a degree of exposure going down that route because our codes are not discrete for this use. Um, if we chose to proceed and try to find zoning that could be uh, perfected, um, as Council is aware, that's a lengthy process. That's about six months, and it would take a significant effort to develop. Um, nonetheless, we're hopeful we can find within the solution set that's available to us, the religious organizations, though I've become aware that um, educational institutions are also able to house um, uh, camps. And again, these are shorter duration. They're not permanent. In terms of expense, um, they typically cost about $250,000 a year to operate. Um, they are usually done with groups that um, sponsor them. Um, what's found, looking at the studies from the five camps in Seattle, is that without caseworkers and managers on site, um, they don't succeed. And we attribute the good, uh, there are certainly the folks from Homes Now have best of intents, but there's a whole skill set that comes in that's needed to address the needs of folks who are in these facilities to move them on um, to permanent housing if possible. And that 250 um, from Seattle in terms of pricing pays for the, uh, the restrooms, the dumpsters and waste removals, electricity, cooking tents, all the things you need security um, to some degree. Um, and those are in partnership. Typically those contracts are awarded to um, groups that um, are comprised of formerly homeless people. So it's not uh, so service providers per se, but they're groups that have assembled. Sure, Wheel is a very common group that has contracts to run a number of them. The challenge is the cost per individual. Um, it's 60 to 70 people for that $250,000. And as a means of a comparison, we were considering in, in briefings before council, spending about $180,000 to get a 200 person low barrier shelter. So we're always facing that issue in terms of benefit. Um, might be a very different clientele. A um, number of the folks who are looking to camp are not, um, are not uh, uh, their needs might not be met by a low barrier shelter. But then again, in any instance, and we did reiterate that this morning, any solution set, there will need to be rules that are established. And those rules are to protect not only the individuals who are using the facility in very close proximity, but also the city, if it's a sponsor um, and if land is supplied, or any institution that supplies that land. So towards that end, um, we're going to take a look a little further to see if there's a solution that could be made. Um, but it is one that uh, would take um, a lot of our resources, um, and we need to focus on that effort. Um, and it would be, I'd, I'd be candid with you, it would be at the expense of other initiatives we've initiated. And just to add something, um, Jim was very appreciative of what the city's doing. I also handed him a They Represent You pamphlet um, to make sure that he had an opportunity to talk to his elected officials, both at the state level and at the county level, with the idea that we would be coordinating, as we're talking about through our um, committee, coordinating our, our efforts in the long run. So. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you know, I appreciated that, but right now I have to admit, um, I'm not sure what direction you would like us to take and I need to know, and I don't know if you need to answer today, I mean at this minute, or if you'd like to answer tonight or have the discussion now or later, but, um, we are going to be, we are going to be right now proceeding one way or another, hopefully before before Christmas or saying, no, this is a more permanent solution. So that is up to you. So let's open that up and maybe talk about it again this evening. But Roxanne and Jean? Well, as for the idea for a longer term camping area, I hope we can just keep this as an idea as we're going forward. We never will know. We might find a religious organization that would be willing to do this. Some organization might open in our town that would be willing to do this. And as for the camp that Ed, as it is, I think it's important for us to manage it the way that we are. 
because we need to work on the body of support that we are providing for this homeless issue. There's so many things going on and I think our community fails to understand all the different ways we're trying to approach this situation through proactive partnerships, through work with our police department, through support from our nonprofits. Let us do that body of work, please, is what I ask. And if there are opportunities to do things that, would our, that our community directly wants like this, we'll pursue it. Gene? Before I say anything, I want to start out by saying that I've been very fortunate in my life growing up in this community and having what I've done, but I've worked very hard for it. Um, I could have been homeless in 1991 when I first hurt my back. I went down. I was making 100% of my income. I went down to 60%. My first wife left, which in the end worked out real well, but it worked out. But what I'm trying to say is the mayor made a good faith effort by letting them stay there. The thing that bothers me the most, and I really have to say this, I don't govern by demands. We get tons of people in here, and we have over the years, demanding this, demanding that. I don't govern that way. I'm not going to look at demands. And I want to remind people, this building belongs to all the citizens of Bellingham. We cannot let one group, no matter who they are, stay on our property. And I can tell you now, there's, we're going to have to spend a lot of money cleaning that grass up and probably have to reseed it and other things. And I'm not trying to be mean about this, but this city has done more since I've been on council for the homeless situation than any governmental agency in Whatcom County. And it's all being shoved at, unfairly at us. It's our problem. We're the only ones that can do anything about it. Well, that's not true at all. But the thing that bothers me the most is them saying now they're not going to go, and they said it last Monday night, they're not leaving until their demands are met. That's wrong. Terry and I went through Occupy Bellingham. That was, that was a very unfortunate situation, and it didn't end very well at all. I empathize with, empathize with those people that are out there. But we have to think of the city as a whole. If this group gets what they want, where do we stop? The next group that comes up and demands something, no matter what it is and no matter what organization it is, we could just trade places week to week on our property. Who do we say no to? So I'm going to be the bad guy, I guess. I'm going to be the ones they can hurl things at. I really don't care. This is the people's house, and we have to treat it as the people's house, and we have to do all we can. For me, I'm interested in an end game, to be completely frank. You did a great job by letting them stay here a few days. Now it's gone on for over a week. So that's where I'm at. I'm fully supportive of looking at a place to put campers, trailers, whatever we have to do, but not by demand because that's what I want to do. But we have to keep this place open for everybody. We, it's just, I, it's been hard. Um, on a lot of people inside this building. I understand that. It's hard on everybody, but I believe we have to be very careful on this and not let it go on too long. Terry? Yeah. yeah. I'm probably the only one up here who has been homeless and had to live in the tent is what I can Okay. Okay. Well, I didn't know because, <laughs> but, but I have had that when I came out of the Army. I lived under a Bisqueen tent for about three months until I could get things working and in another period in my life that, that happened. So I do understand the hardship of doing that. I would not be opposed at all if there's a religious institution or school that would offer a place for that and we could work out with them a set of rules that as long as these things occur they can stay there for this period of time but if these rules are broken, if sanitation gets, so b gets bad, if, the, if criminality is breaking out, that there's a way to say it has to disperse. So I would be willing to look at that and discuss it tonight, later, but I just, you know. Um, I, I appreciate the, um, that these people are very concerned about them and them are indeed homeless themselves and are concerned about homelessness. Um, I think Kelly said it. We are doing a great deal 
to solve the homeless issue and housing issues in general. As I said last week, the Homeless Strategies Work Group met. Um, I, I think the purpose behind the demonstration is done, right? It was to draw attention to the issue of homelessness, and I think that's a, we're a soft target. We're already aware of the of seriousness of homelessness, and we're already taking it seriously. So I think the demonstration, as a demonstration, is done. Now, with regard to the camping issue, camping is not low impact. Camping is a rather high impact activity. Um, and so you need to be really careful about what you do setting up uh, camping sites. Um, apparently, uh, there are options that uh, these uh, temporary campsites can be set up when properly sponsored under state law. Um, a church can step up, but the churches I know that are active, some of them that I know that are active in homelessness, they've opened up their entire basement to become a shelter, for example, and they're already doing many things. I don't know if setting up a camp or sponsoring a camp is the best thing to do, given the effort, the time, and the money to address homelessness. Um, so, yeah, maybe we should keep looking at the idea of safe camping, but I'm just not sure that's the, the best solution to serving the greatest number of people, given the amount of effort that would be involved. Um, we, you know, we've got to do something about homelessness. We are doing something about homelessness. Uh, I'm just not so sure that, that camping is really the best solution. So, Kelly, I, I don't know. I just know that, that camping is not a low-impact low activity. Uh, one of the reasons why we had to do so-called sweeps is when illegal camps were set up near our, our um, sensitive riparian areas near, near you know, streams, there's been a huge amount of environmental damage that's gone on to sensitive habitat. Camping is not a low impact, especially a place that isn't properly set up, for example, doesn't have bathrooms. So the camps we've cleaned up are often littered with human waste um, and garbage because if you don't have the proper amenities, if you have no place to go to the bathroom and no place to put your waste, any camp is going to be a disaster. So, I mean, uh, so camping has to be uh, approached uh, carefully. Um, I do know that uh, some people are experiencing homelessness even if they do find place in a shelter. Um, there are serious concerns with how to clean their clothes and do laundry, how to take showers. Uh, there's always been chronic concerns about where to store their possessions. So if you're homeless, you're often subject to the risk of theft of your valuables. I think that uh, that was one of the things that was discussed at the Homeless Strategies Work Group is moving forward on being able to support homeless people. If we can't provide them housing right now, we can at least help them with staying clean, laundering their clothes, finding safe storage. These aren't solutions to homelessness, but they address some of the difficulties that people who are experiencing homelessness have to deal with. Um, those are just some of my thoughts on the issue. Uh, I guess we can keep talking about it tonight, but Dan? Um, well, as someone who's a housing advocate, seeing um, people camp unsheltered and uh, conditions that aren't met for human beings um, is, you know, it's, it's very disheartening. <clears throat> um, I know that the organization had contacted several churches. I think they cited 35 different faith communities and were rejected by, by those um, entities. But I think that might have been more for the uh, tiny house uh, concept that, that they were trying to get off the ground. And I don't know if that's for um, a safe camping situation. Pardon me. And I know the mayor has brought up a safe parking um, concern uh, because of the vehicles over on Orchard Place or Terrace, whatever the, the street is over near the hospital. Um, I don't operate by demands either. I think that that's not really um, the best way forward. I think that we're all sort of on the same team here when it comes to wanting to help as uh, folks the best we can with the limited resources that we have. Uh, and things are, you know, with, with vacancy rates being what they are and housing prices increasing. We, we were at the presentation that um, Ted from Commerce gave back in June at the town hall that we probably won't see this getting better. So the, the more we can, we can do to help try to accommodate or stem the flow so to speak, um, I think that that's the direction I would like to see. I don't know if it, and I know the staff is buried right now in terms of all of these other items and priorities, so I don't know that. It's, is it the staff that would, you know, reach out again to these faith communities with this more specific idea of like a safe parking or a safe camping on a very limited basis versus the, the tiny homes? And I do agree with whoever said that we have to have the services part of it. We have to have rules and we have to have management, otherwise it's going to be a problem. And I think the suggestion was, and I am willing to do it, that the mayor might contact Interfaith Coalition or others um, to see. 
And I guess I'd still like to hear from April mm -hmm. and Pinky on this before April. I make a comment. <laughs> you had your hand up. Well, um, thank you, Mayor, because I, I, you know, you're in a very different situation than we are as electeds, and um, and I, I appreciate. I, I'm elected too. <laughs> well, then, then as you know, we're not administrators. We're not administrators, and you, you're put in, um, and it's all on your shoulders and and your staffs, of course. So I, I do appreciate the approach that you've taken, uh, and the sensitivity that you've brought to the table in regards to these things. I appreciate staff and trying to look quickly and to see anything that they can do, but I, I always have to come back to the policies and the processes and everything that we've put forward and we have set priorities on how we're going to go about this and finding a tent city and even finding a safe parking was, was not in those priorities. And um, it's, uh, I, I easily, uh, I, I joke with my kids, uh, squirrel, <laughs> because we easily, uh, it, it, things come right at you and, and we can get so focused that um, we'll end up just kind of spinning that wheel a little bit before we go back. So, um, so I do wanna just appreciate you in the position that you're in and thank you for coming and, and asking our opinion. Uh, I, I, yes, I would strongly encourage, and it, I, I don't think you need a motion to do it, but yes, in reaching out to our uh, religious institutions to see what they can also offer. We already have the Interfaith Coalition who, it, it might be, a, a, it's not as large as what this is happening, but they just got an award from the Whatcom Family and Community Network for the work that they're doing. Maybe they have more capacity. Maybe that's a place where we could we might have some discretionary funds to be able to help uh, asking uh, if it was just the tiny homes that was asked for, maybe acting as a conduit to see if there might be some other options. But ultimately, we have to keep our eye on those long-term projects. And I don't want to see, we have a lot of housing barriers that we're looking at next year, all those things. And I, I don't want to see staff, um, I, I personally, with this short of time and knowing all the things we went through, I don't want to see us change directions. I want to see us keep going where we're headed. And so I don't know if that helps you at all. <laughs> I'll ask you a blunt question when you're all done. So. Okay. <laughs> Pinky. Uh, Mayor, I want to echo that. Thank you very much. I know you're trying to um, solve as many things as you can. Um, and I do want to be sympathetic to the situation that the um, people are dealing with right now. However, in saying that, like Jean said, dealing through demands is not the best way for us to legislate. We've been dealing with um, addressing the homeless crisis for over two years, and there are a lot of things that if we could have solved them, we would have already done that. So just making it a demand doesn't make it any easier to solve. Um, and I'd like us to stay on track in, in regards to the things that we're working on and progressing on um, in regards to our homeless crisis. Uh, one thing I would be supportive of, Mayor, is if you reached out to um, to the faith community and maybe ask them. But other than that, I, I really think that we should stay on track where we are right now um, instead of getting... Um, derailed in regards to um, what's being asked of us. Even though we are very sympathetic to the challenges, I also think it, it is prudent of us to stay on track in regards to the goals that we have outlined and achieving those as soon as possible. Kelly? So I, I think your comments um, reflect what myself and the staff are thinking, is that we don't have the resources to do everything. Um, the very hard question to ask is because I also do not want to get into a maritime heritage situation like we were, and that is one of my goals. So um, when we write the permit, I hear you saying we should have an end date on the permit. I need to know that, and if you don't all want to make the commitment right now, I'll ask you again this afternoon or this evening. But um, that's where we are right now. We're deciding what, how long our demonstration can go on, how long our camping can go on. And, and without, de um, without direction from you, I wasn't sure exactly what to do. So that's what I'm asking, is when we write the permit, when Jim Tenner writes the permit, that there needs to be then an end date. And if anybody feels uncomfortable with that right now, they need to let me know, not necessarily right now, but they need to let me know. And I need to have an idea about 
Rick was thinking on Friday. I don't, you know, I mean, it's getting very close. So, and what that means is that we will be asking people to move along instead of staying in the city hall um, property. So, Roxanne and Dan. I just make a motion that the permit would include an end date of Friday or whatever date would be best suited for administration's perspective. Second. I have a motion to provide feedback or to the administration uh, with regard to your question about how to handle the permitting issue. The motion is to seek a definite end date, perhaps the end of this week. Uh, do you and want to I, vote on that motion or to hear from uh, Dan first? Mayor, you had mentioned um, Friday as the end date with some extension clause. I, I don't know if I heard that correctly. Um, what is well, that? Well, and if there was, you know, if there was a possibility that a religious institution or an educational institution would stand up to sponsor a location. Mr. Tenner. Mr. Tenner's here. Does he have something to share? Anyway, if there was, if there, if there was some you know, light at the end of the tunnel about that, we could extend. If there isn't light at the end of the tunnel, then that would be more difficult. I so see. that's that. Uh, that's the concern. So if the church had the capacity to do it, but not on Friday, but it was like on Sunday or, or whatever, you know, a few we days later. We certainly could accommodate that. Mm -hmm. right. As, as I understand, the, and then Mr. Rafato. The, um, the request came in with the date on Monday. I think we left this morning in good faith with the meeting with them to try to get back with them on Friday to see if we've made any traction. And just to clarify, a religious organization doesn't have to fund the use, just provide the land. Peter? Yeah, and just to, in uh, the motion, I think, is in the nature of an ad ad advisement because ultimately nice. that permitting decision is an, an right. administrative decision. Mm -hmm. no, well, I'm looking for advice. So, so <laughs> the, the motion is to uh, express our opinion and advice to the mayor to indeed, if a permit is issued, to the demonstrators to look for a definite end date to the demonstration. Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Um, Thank you. I, I do agree. We should work towards the end of the demonstration, as as Dan said. You know, we're already pretty much on the same team, and as Mickey said, you know, we're working on it. If we could have had it solved by now, we would have. Um, I do think we need to uh, assure them that we're looking for some short-term solutions before we get shelters up for safe storage, for safe parking, for the laundry facility, showering. Right now, it's the, it's the Y is the only option. Vouchers for at the Y, and maybe that's not enough. These are ways we can support people who are experiencing homelessness while we try to look for longer-term solutions. And we still keep funding the homeless outreach team, the uh, homeless uh, services center, uh, ways of getting people to proper services and to temporary housing and then into supportive or stable housing. I mean, anyway, I, uh, we're still under old and new. I have one other item. Anybody else have something under old and new? Oh. Um, yes, Pinky? I'll do mine really quick because I know we're way behind time. We are. Um, there's a, a, oh. I did a little draft of a spreadsheet to see what our um, council committee tools are. I got a little bit more information to put in here. Also noticed that I didn't put in um, council president, mayor pro tem, uh, so <laughs> those and, um, and mayor pro tem, so I have to include those as well. Um, and then as soon as I get this flushed out completely, I'm going to send the spreadsheet to you. So instead of you having to give me individual information, this gives Gives you very specific what we're looking for is like how many um, things that are not in our actual reorganization plan or if there's any additional hours that you have to put on a committee um, additional materials times or um, maybe the duration etc so uh, or if you have to if you are attending a if your committee includes a board meeting and also if you have to chair that committee. So I'm going to put all of those things into this metrics and then I will um, uh, take a look at them and I'll put them in three tiers, three tiers of the amount of commitment and time. Um, and then so when we come to our reorganization meeting, uh, it'll be clear what the different tiers are and instead of just doing things alphabetically, we can do them in, in our reorg by the amount of commitment that each person has to put on these and I think it will give us a much better idea and, and a little bit more equality in regards to what our commitments are and what we're taking on 
if there is information, uh, the reason I'm showing this right now is if you think there's a column that's missing that should be put in there, if you could please send that to us and uh, Marie and I will modify this spreadsheet. But uh, hopefully we can send this out to you by the end of the week. And if you could please send it back by the end of December so you have a couple weeks so that we have preparation for our reorg meeting um, so I can crunch the numbers and put it in a tier system. So I'll need a little bit of time to do that. I have one question. So uh, you wanted us to give feedback on kind of the amount of workload it was. Is that yeah. going in this fourth column, this meeting or hours per month? Is that where that would go? Meeting hours per month. And that's why I, I didn't know what to do around public works and natural resources because the Lake Wacom Committee is every quarter. So haven't quite, that's why I've got 0.25 because I'm not really sure what that's going to be. Um, so anything that you, obviously if you're on that committee, you might have your own numbers. This is just... Uh, examples and um, and we'll flush this out so as soon as I get this finished I'll send it to you I just wanted you to be aware that this is coming and if you could please put in the information for your own committees and if there's missing anything please let us know and we'll update it great thank you I have another item for old and news but I'll handle it this evening anything else under old and news stand right now we are running a little bit about an hour behind we're now going to uh, recess for executive session there's one item in the executive session uh, lasting approximately 20 minutes in duration. I'm hoping a little bit less than that. It's a litigation matter, Parrot versus the City of Bellingham et al. Um, I'll be back here around 5 o'clock. We are in recess. <laughs>